Gungrave. The story of a dead man called Grave, who wields a pair of gun and uses said pair of gun to send his enemies into their grave. It's a revenge story about supernatural powers and the grimy mafia underworld, told through stylish cutscenes and a simple but enjoyable gameplay loop. The game knew what it wanted to do and nailed it. An anime adaptation covering Grave's early days was also greenlit and aired for 26 episodes in 2003. Then in 2004 came Gungrave Overdose, a full-fledged sequel. But this time Red Entertainment handed all development duties over to Ikusabune, the studio that created the cutscenes for the first game and whose resume mostly consists of planning and animation work. What could possibly go wrong? Three years have passed since the events of the original game, in which Grave sent the Syndicate's ambitions into the dirt. Mika placed him in cold storage in order to preserve his body, where he sleeps until the day his abilities are needed once more. And that day has arrived with a hail of bullets no less. After the destruction of the Syndicate, the seed drug was supposed to have been eradicated, but someone has restarted production and it's spreading like wildfire. Mika has been on the case, and she got herself on the wrong end of someone's business. Her investigation leads them to a brand new criminal organization, the Corsione family. Led by Don Corsione and his adopted son Garino, these punks have quickly grown powerful and took down their rifles with an army of seed mutants called Orgmen. If they were just trying to make wads of cash from selling the drug, then that would be something. But there's more to their plans than what meets the eye. Ghosts from Grave's past have also come back to haunt him. The assassin who wields the center head of Cerberus is now under the Corsione family's command, and so is a woman looking for payback for the deaths of her father and husband. But the pair won't be fighting them alone. Mika herself has grown up and matured. She might not have supernatural powers, but she's no longer the frail girl she was in the first game, taking responsibility as the new gang's commander, coming up with plans and strategies to get them out of trouble. The two are joined by a cheeky little punk called Spike, a scientist prodigy with a mysterious past, as well as two drifters, Chuji Kabane and Rocket Billy Red Cadillac. Juji is your typical no bollock sedgeward with a tragic past, a blind swordsman with a pair of gun blades and an acute sense of smell. He's kind of insufferable early on, when every scene makes it really thick how angry he is. But that's somewhat justified due to the sick experiments that Garino performed on him and he won't stop at anything until he gets revenge. In contrast, Billy is the laid-back Joker, who seems like he doesn't take stuff seriously but deep inside is a total gentleman. Oh, and he's also a ghost haunting an electric guitar. Why? Because it's cool. And that sums up the direction that Overdose takes. More cool, more flashy, more campy. Just look at the boys dancing on her mom's gravestone. By comparison, the original game was more down-to-earth, more grounded in its worldview and focused on telling a personal story. It was simple and clean, you know who you are, you know what you have to do, and you know who to shoot in the face. The sequel lifts up to its name in several ways. It's a much bigger game, with levels that are longer and in larger quantities, and with an amount of dialogue that far exceeds its predecessor. It should also be noted that Gungrave worked as its own self-contained story, while Overdose expects you to have watched the entire anime to fully comprehend the actions of certain characters. Of course, Grave is practically an emotionless mute, so there wasn't much room for dialogue in the first place. With a longer running time and a wider cast of characters, Overdose can go all the way, with intrigue, exposition, drama and even comedy. 
The downside is that Grave has effectively become a non-character, since he has very little presence in the story scenes, besides making angry faces and doing the shooty bang bang. The dialogue has to be driven by the others, so Grave doesn't get as many opportunities to show his silent charisma. For better or for worse, it has a different atmosphere and, you know, sometimes it's the endearing kind of dumb schlock that brings out a smile. At the very least, there's plenty of fireworks to watch. But sometimes it's also the kind of dumb that tries to be clever and meaningful, but is merely dumb and leaves you scratching your head with a blender. There is this scene that portrays Billy doing a heroic sacrifice to at the other's advance, and then a couple of scenes later he's back with the gang like nothing happened and nobody even acknowledges it. And why is he suddenly shirtless on the final boss? I can hear the shrieking voices of the fangirls. It's somewhat ironic that the game tries to chuck all this style at the wall when most stages are so artistically subdued. There's less Chinatown and trippy stairways, and a whole lot more of ravaged buildings, dirty back alleys and shiny metal factories. And that's not to mention the technical downgrade. Besides making animated cutscenes look cool, the first game's high contrast visuals with their pitch black shadows served the functional purpose of hiding the rough edges of the 3D models, something that isn't as often and as well utilized in overdose. The poor kid's neck is collapsing under his big scientist brain. The gameplay was also downgraded to 30 FPS, and I think the developers tried to compensate for this with a motion blur effect, but the result is that there's ghosting all over the place, and it does more damage to the visuals than the lower frame rate. The soundtrack is also mostly comprised of tracks recycled from the original game, or for some reason completely absent in certain sections. Like its predecessor, Overdose is an arcadey third-person shooter where you head from one point to the next while shooting some dweebs on the head, getting rated on how cool you were and watching a cutscene or two in the middle. The basics remain, but Grave is more nimble and all around faster. Running is your default speed now, and dodge shooting fires a quick burst of bullets that deals a ton of damage and leaves you practically invulnerable. A bit too much even. Aiming is still automatic and blowing up stuff still increases the beat counter. The longer you keep it going, the quicker it feeds the demolition gauge, and the more often you can dump special attacks on enemies. There's 9 in total, divided into 3 subgroups. The forward cleaners, the spin to wins and the bullet times. However, the maximum ammo capacity has dropped to just 4, and the stronger demolition shots require 2 or 3 charges to fire. There's also no option to recover life and shield anymore, it's tied to the demolition shots themselves. Overdose also attempts to expand the gameplay beyond holding the fire button to kill hordes of punching bags. You've got enemies with swords that can deflect bullets, so you're incentivized to get up in their face and apply Coffin, which can now perform combos and a jump attack that stuns enemies. Some enemies will carry shields and rocket launchers, but you can reflect them with melee attacks or take a defensive position to block incoming damage. But there's more. Beating the game lets you play as Chuchi and Billy, who have their own weapons and demolition shots. The basic framework is pretty much identical, but the gameplay flows somewhat differently. Both have basic ranged and melee attacks and a selection of demolition shots that are functionally identical as far as I can tell. But Chuji has a pair of gun blades to rely upon for melee, with a longer combo and a charge attack that does generous amounts of damage. He also has very fast dodging, and it's kinda fun to yoink around while spamming dodge shots. It's just a shame that he had the misfortune of being stuck in a game with subpar melee combat. 
Meanwhile, Billy is focused on ranged attacks, and can zap multiple dudes from a distance while striking fabulous poses, and also blocking projectiles with his crotch. Really puts the rocket in Rocket Billy. He's arguably the easiest to play as due to his crazy lightning attacks, and it's difficult not to crack a smile when he's so over the top. The guy exudes energy, it's beautiful. On the whole, it's a promising package. You have new gameplay mechanics to raise the skill ceiling, and a much longer campaign with multiple characters to play as. Sure, all of them go through the same levels and bosses, and the story only has minor changes, but Chuji and Billy are worth giving a shot at the very least. Like damn, this is what I play video games for. And for those who put the time in, there's a whole bunch of unlockables to play with, from turbo speed and boss rush, to alternate costumes for all three characters and even a pseudo first person mode. You wanted more content? Here's more content. By all means, Overdose should be the perfect sequel. Except that it seems like the developers didn't fully understand what made the first Gungrave work so well. The mechanics were simple and limited, so the layout of each stage was also kept simple. It mostly consisted of spacious corridors that didn't conflict with the camera, and enemies usually spawned right ahead, where the auto-aim could easily target them. In Overdose, it feels like the levels were built for a game without those limitations. Every five minutes, it places the player in rooms that would cause a claustrophobic to enter cardiac arrest, while simultaneously throwing saltine crackers in your face by spawning large amounts of enemy waves in each area, frequently right behind you without a single hint that they appeared. Seriously, jump into the enemy rush mode for 5 seconds and the difference in playability is immediately apparent, as the wide empty area gives you enough room to move around freely while also not being castrated by the camera clashing against everything. Yes, the right analog stick was granted camera controls, but hold your excitement. It's the kind of camera control that instantly snaps back to the default position when you let go, making it totally unusable when you most need it. Blocking with the coffin is too slow to be useful, and deflecting rockets back at enemies isn't worth it when it locks you in place, mouth wide open for a cup of high explosives. So you end up relying on dodging and shooting to clear a path to victory that and spamming demolition shots, since certain late game areas have enemies that deal so much damage and can easily knock you down that it effectively forces you to exploit the mechanics to stun lock enemies if you want to actually have fun. It's one of those games where it seems like you have to exploit the mechanics in uncool ways to survive. Compound it with the shoddy camera, and the gameplay sinks into a cycle of dodging and triggering demolition shots to recover your shield. It still regenerates on its own, but now it only starts regenerating if the player isn't attacking, rather than regenerating if the player doesn't get hit for a couple of seconds. So instead of being careful and prioritizing enemies to minimize danger, the game promotes being a pussy, not an unstoppable bulldozer with a pair of hand cannons. And with enemies tearing through your shield so easily, the flow of the gameplay is constantly starting and stopping. Honorable mention goes to that one platforming section with gaps that are just a tad too awkward to jump over and has infinitely respawning enemies that can easily knock you back and force you to walk back to the start point. Why? Or how about a final boss that forces the game into slow motion unless you enable your own slow motion to get the game back into normal speed so you can actually, you know, play a video game? Double Y? And I haven't mentioned it until now, but one of Grave's new abilities is a charge shot. Too bad I can't use it, because I turned the auto-fire setting on so I wouldn't need to mash the fire button. Triple Y? 
The Otto Waming also seems to have a mind of its own sometimes, and can be very inconsistent when you're up against enemies above the player. One egregious example of this happens in a battle against an helicopter, where it moves from one end to the other while firing its machine gun. Just regular auto-aiming won't do anything, you have to use the lock-on to hit it. But because it has such a short range and likes to be very picky about the exact position and distance that you have to be in for it to activate, a battle that should have taken 5 minutes at most is stretched into a 20-minute lobotomy. I've already repeated it a billion times in different ways, but Overdose is a much less tightly designed game than its predecessor was. Sometimes less is more. Less means that you don't stumble over your ideas with mediocre execution. This is especially true with Juji, due to Melee being incredibly unreliable, and his super fast movements making the controls feel very imprecise and the action hard to follow. In other words, clunky. Cool, stylish, but clunky at best, and not even playtested at worst, since the combo's final hit tends to miss against certain enemies, and bosses have super armor that triggers an invincible, knocked down state before you're done. When it's all working out properly, the gameplay is fun, even if spamming the dodge shot dwarfs anything else you can do, thanks to its high damage and invincibility frames. The joy of being an edgy murder machine is still there, even if it's a schizophrenic murder machine. But damn if it doesn't try really hard to make me hate it. At times it's a fun, mindless romp, and at other times, it's like banging my head against a particularly stubborn wall. I imagine that the developers wanted to address the criticisms of the first game being too short, and then ended up overcompensating for it in the most misguided ways. But it's not the size that matters, it's how you use it. It doesn't really matter how many levels you throw at the game, if they're not designed around the gameplay systems. Some of its gameplay additions are ultimately inconsequential, while its contributions to the lore were mostly forgotten by its late successor. Actually, it's interesting how Gore suffers from the opposite problem. It's just as long, if not even longer than Overdose, but while most levels are fine, most of them. Its main fault is some of the core mechanics that needed more tweaking and refinement. Stuff like hitbox chank, or an upgrade system where half the upgrades feel tacked on and the other half is essentially required. Whatever the case, Gungrave fell into a long coma after 2004, only recently reawakening in a landscape detached from that of the sixth console generation, where the design trends that once ruled the market have long been replaced. But that's a story for another day.